Words, words, words. The globe is full of words. And now there is a plethora of words and a density of words on this planet that has never been there before. We are all the time surrounded wherever we are, at least where there's a field and a signal, by virtual words, messages. The air is full not only of moving molecules that communicate the messages that you're receiving right now, but also with messages that we cannot see. It's damaging the planet. But there is also a third level of words. It's that that no one can see or hear. It's the interior life. And actually, there can be in that sphere, very mysterious as it is, at times, a frontier very thin between, for instance, words that we might now and again perceive from our guardian angel or the Holy Ghost. I may have told this before, but I'll just mention it to make you aware of what can actually happen with regard to the guardian angel. Just say two brief accounts which are both true, is to invite you to sharpen your antennae to these words. Because by the way, the more we want it, the more they're glad to give it. We don't give them work to do. This happened some years ago. It was on a fairly busy road. Now, I forget whether it was Poland, I think it was Poland. And this lady was driving the car. And she was coming up a fairly steep hill. And she heard, notice, she heard in her this word slow down. And it was so objective that she put her foot on the brake with no apparent reason for it. She got to the brow of the hill, and boy, was there a reason for it. Had she not heard and responded to that word, she and the person in the car on the wrong side would have been in eternity. Listen to that at the wheel. This other one happened I think more recently in time again. It was a strange case. I think this one was in America. And it was the case of a very good, caring priest. Now, by the way, these things matter. A pastor of souls gives all for one soul and has time for one soul. We're losing that, by the way, with a new managerial style of parish priests delegating much of their priestly ministry to lay people while they are obliged to attend meetings and work on files at a computer. A victory for you know who. Well, this good priest was following a good Catholic lady and her husband in the parish. And a good Catholic lady, as many good Catholic ladies now, had settled for just a good man. Okay, it can work, it's not the ideal, but at least if he's an honest worker, she will get family, support, and it can lead to a certain joy. It's not the maximum, but it can work. So she settled for that option, and her husband was a good, honest man. But he was not baptized. And because there was no deliberate malice, it would seem, there was no reason why he shouldn't be. And so discreetly, the wife would talk him about the importance of his soul. And the priest was aware of the dialogue, and he was following the couple. 
And every so often, because he wasn't a bad man, he would drop a hint. And he would always put it on a long finger. Not just yet. His wife redoubled her prayers because by this stage he was getting quite ill and he didn't have, it would seem, an awful lot of time left. I think he had cancer. And by this stage he was actually in hospital. And it was, of all days, a Sunday morning. Now, a priest is very busy on a Sunday morning. This was no exception. But something, notice, in his heart said, go to the hospital today, to that man. And he did. And for some reason, when it came to the nth time of asking, this response came out of nowhere. Well, actually, Father, I've been looking back over things, and I would like to get reconciled. Would you like baptism? Actually, I would. It doesn't stop there. He had with him the necessary for the celebration, and he was preparing all the bits and bobs, chrism and all. And suddenly he, notice, heard objectively and strongly in his heart one word. Now! So because it was objective and so realistic and real, he just got hold of the only immediately available vessel that he had, some clinical dish, filled it with just some water, and said, in the name, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And he didn't have time to add, Amen, before he was in eternity. The man died at the last word of the baptismal formula. Now, these things matter. It happened to me one time in Italy. I was just doing my fortnightly round of taking the dirty linen from the guest house, because the guest master, to the laundry in Montalcino. And I wanted to get back to Vespers. And I sort of heard this, I didn't really hear it, but it was a pretty strong message I was picking up from somewhere. Go to Don Pietro. Don Pietro was, he'd been for years, the priest of the sanctuary, where the Madonna had done a miracle years ago. And he was in retirement, I knew where he was, the lady was looking after him. And I remember saying to myself, well, it'd be a good charitable act. We really, don't be pushed for time at this stage of Vespers, leave it till tomorrow. And again, it sort of came, go and visit Don Pietro. Tomorrow is a huge hire. Anyway, I got back in time for Vespers, and the following morning at chapter, the prior came out with this. Don Pietro has gone to his eternal reward. Egypt, why didn't you listen? The Lord wanted a priest next to Don Pietro, who had actually been ordained in our church during the war, or just before it. And, by the way, I know from local people, had celebrated in the, on our altar during the bombardment in the abbey, and there were planes and bombs around the whole area, and all the congregation fell on their faces because there were bombs falling. What will he do? Will he continue or not? And they looked up, he sped, he spab, he sped through the, what he had to do, but never interrupted and carried on because you can't interrupt once you've started. So that was the way he handled Jesus. He wouldn't mess around with the Blessed Sacrament. Faithful to the end, he deserved someone to be with him. Okay, where am I landing? That element of picking things up applies to you as well. 
because the Holy Spirit will give you graces according to your state, e.g. A father of a family has grace of state as a father of a family. He will get inspirations of wisdom and prudence for his family. He must pick them up because he's exercising the authority of God the Father for his family. Remember that he has the power of blessing over his children and he is the last word, as the abbot would be, in a monastery because the authority is from God and his order in a marriage. A teacher has grace of state for the class. If he's teaching a class, he might pick up this message, as a preacher would actually, give them this story, this message. It will be there for somebody before them that they don't know. Because that happens. The Holy Spirit knows what you need and what the class needs. And the way to give it is also important. A way that will get their attention. No matter what you say, if it's not interesting, it will pass in one ear and come out of the other. And so through all the categories of life, there is a grace of state. And one hasn't got that grace if one is not doing something within that state. E.g., I've seen this happen. A person who meddles. It could be in a parish, it could be in a monastery. Somebody who starts correcting people without authority is not under the Holy Spirit doing his own thing and usually damaging. There's no grace of state for that there. I just want to finish. This kind of picking up of things nowadays is completely damaged by the number of words that make it difficult to pick up. Notice in this parable there's a list of things which make it not bear fruit. Thorns. These are they who have heard and as they go their way are choked by the cares, worry. Remember what John Lennon said one time, life is what happens when you're planning the next thing to do. And riches, I'm just reading right now a very well written, investigated book on the whole situation in the Vatican finances. It's pretty frightening. But those involved are priests quite often, bishops, even cardinals, who are obliged to do what a lay people should be doing and doing it well. That's not what a priest is for. They have to do it. But also it can be your case. Don't overcomplicate your life. A very expensive holiday is not the happiest. Quality time at home is sometimes simpler and far less dispersive. And pleasures of life. Do you know that on this point, Epicurus had it right on this point. The absence of needs gives freedom. And pleasure is, on the level of the soul, the absence of needs. The soul that creates new needs creates pain. Does that sound familiar? There is freedom in abdication over the world, and also in absence of an incessant flow of words.